matter happy sunday to you a blessed sunday i couldn't wait to talk about this not just because it's so-called black history month okay this is a woman that so many of you need to know about that i named it in the title that history forgot when i first heard about who she was I instantly thought, my goodness, she deserves a film made about her. When I found out her tragic story, her death, I was so, it was very heartbreaking. And I just thought, I just can't believe I, I had never heard of her and so many other people. So I want to talk about her. You see the name, the Black Patty, and this woman. Let me let me calm down because I'm just so excited to share with you who this woman was and so much more. We're going to have a great discussion and, um, you know, I have my notes as usual. Now, she was called the Black Patty. She didn't always care to be called that. Her real name was Matilda. Ciceretta Joyner Jones. And it's so sad that she didn't even have her tombstone until about 2018. I think they finally raised money to give her a gravestone. And I want to talk about hey, in your face, I want to talk about, you know who she was. I want to share the history about who this woman was that that history forgot that the so-called black community forgot. Believe me, we're going to talk about this. And um okay. The black patty. Look at her looking all regal. This woman at one point was the highest paid black entertainer in the entire country. Now, for that time period, during the 1800s, do you know how major that was? Do you know how major it was that this was the highest paid black entertainer in history of that time? And we don't even know at large her name. The fact that she had been forgotten to me was a disgrace. And I don't want to focus on the negative. I want to celebrate her life today. And she'll be one of a few that I share. And I just said, there's no way we can't talk about her. Okay. I want to share a clip. I'm going to tell you about who she was, and I'm going to share a clip about a short, a very short clip about her life and everything that happened. And, um, you know, so this is the Black Patty, Ciceretta Jones. She was an American soprano, she was a, a singer an opera singer, a soprano. Now, the way that she got her name, the Black Patty, well, she was named after 
Well, she was. It was a similarity a little bit, and she was a, a critic had named her after Adelina Patty. Her name was Adelina Patty. Yes, get those likes up. As a matter of fact, let me put that in the chat. Hold on one second. <laughs> Okay. This is one, just one of the many. Give me one second, it's buffering a little bit. Okay. All right. So she was the, the woman that you see on the right. Her name was Adelina Patty. She was also a very famous opera singer. OK. She was a very famous opera singer as well. Named Adelina Patty. And the woman on the left was nicknamed the Black Patty. But her real name was Matilda Ciceretta Joyner Jones. Now. I'm going to give you the okay. Now I'm going to give you a history lesson on the Black Patty really quick before we get into uh the clip that I want to share with you. All right. Again, she was an American soprano opera singer during the 1800s, and she rose to fame. She rose to fame and was the highest paid black singer in the entire country during that time. She became so popular that she would sing for four American presidents, one of them was President Benjamin Harrison and four other presidents, including Theodore Roosevelt and the British royal family. She rose from poverty by using her voice and gained international fame. She also toured South America, Australia, India, Europe, and South Africa. Do you know how big this was for the 1800s and the position that a number of Black women were in? This was a big deal during that time. A very big deal. And I, again, I'll repeat it again. I just can't believe the success she had. And we don't even know. I guarantee you the average black person and people just in this country period don't know her name or who she was or what happened. So. All right. She made her debut in the year 1888 in New York. In New York. And she made her debut at a place called Steinway Hall. Steinway Hall in 1888. So I want to talk about something really quick, something very important. Because I'll keep saying it again about us not knowing who she was. All right. There was something that sort of bothered my spirit. And I want to address it because it has to be said. 
Now, I'm going to give a good example about something. And you just said exactly what I'm about to say, mind over matter. Mind over matter says we have to preserve history ourselves. Thank you. That's exactly what I have written down, what I wanted to say. A lot of black people, it is your responsibility and nobody else to remember people who had an impact that came from your people. Now, I believe all humans are equal. Everybody should be, be remembered. Everybody makes a difference and has an impact. But let's be real. There are a lot of black women who have been forgotten. And we forgot about her. We, I didn't even know about her. But whose fault is that? That I didn't know who she was. Why come black people? Thank you, Danny Ellie. Why come we don't know about her from other older black people? And I'm going to give a great example of what I'm talking about. I'm going to show you someone. I know some of you have, have heard of this man. Where is that picture? This man, his name was Louis Armstrong. He was very popular around the 1940s, the 1950s. He has a very legendary American national song that we love. I said American, it's called What a Wonderful World. And I was looking at the video the other day because like I said before, I really like older music as well. And it's a beautiful song that he wrote and made. It's a classic, an American classic. And I was looking under the comment section and majority of the people praising him for the music he made were white. And I don't have an issue. I don't care about that at all. But one comment that stood out to me, there was a white guy who said, why is it that we seem to love him more than his own race? I mean, this is literally under the comment section under the video here on YouTube. And I'm like, oh, my God, because majority of the people that love the song or appear to that were making comments under it and saying this guy, you know, this song he created is an absolute gem to the nation. Um, and he didn't understand, well, why do we seem to like and care for this piece of art in this music that it had an impact about the beauty of the world and people, and I see the beauty in it, and his own group of people, they don't even seem to give not one crap about it. I know it's just music and everything like that, but it's much deeper than that. I've heard this before. From uh, under some type of video with when a white person saying something like that. And it's the same thing even if we can talk about Black Lives Matter. Again, it, where are the, the lives of black women and black children? You know, the point he was making is why does it seem like some of them don't even care as much as we do or acknowledge certain people? So I thought of that when I thought of the Black Patty because... No one can say or blame or come in with, see, they they don't want us to know our history. What? Why do you have to have anyone, if you want to be tribal and racist or whatever, why do you have to have anybody from a different group have to tell you about famous or impactful people that came from um, your ethnicity or, or your um, race or whatever? Why do you have to have them tell you about her? Why don't you know about her? And those that didn't know about her, why didn't they keep her legacy alive and pass down the history? I understand the importance about Black history. I get why there's a month for it. But I used to tell someone, I mean, American history is sort of Black history. I mean, Black and white people, well, the original Africans and all that stuff and all. All of that is a part of the makeup of the country. The parts we don't like, the history, I don't even have to get into it on both ends. But let me not lose my train of thought. The thing is, why is it that even Black people at large don't know certain people within the history? 
I mean, it's not our fault we don't know about Black Patty. I didn't hear about her because no one ever talked about her. I never heard anybody. Um, I never heard anybody Black, older, talk about her. And the funny thing is, when I found out about her, I got this information from white people or a white man or whatever who made a video about her. That's how I found out about her. And yes, this is definitely her story, not just history, says Cool Be um, Beings Podcast. So I wanted to make that small point, but let's get back on celebrating the Black Patty and learning about her. Well, her story, what happened to her, sort of reminds me of Florence Ballard from The Supremes. Another black woman, in my opinion, who was sort of forgotten about. I like older music. I know about the Supremes. I found out years ago what happened to Florence. She rose to fame with the Supremes. The founding member ended up on welfare, was done completely dirty, and died very young and had children. And I always thought Florence's story is terrible. And it kind of reminds me of the Black Patty. You know? But we're going to get into that. Now, she also sang for the President Theodore Roosevelt at one point. She also sang at the very famous Carnegie Hall in New York. I believe that's in New York. Okay. Now, she was born and raised to, uh, for a small time in Portsmouth, Virginia. In Portsmouth, Virginia. Her father was a minister. Her father was a minister and her mother was a singer in the choir and a washerwoman. She started singing very young around the house and eventually she started singing in the church after she moved to Providence, Rhode Island. Now she attended, okay, a, a school in 1883. She's, she studied music at Providence Academy of Music. She studied with Ada Baroness Lacombe and was later accepted into the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, again, later her career became very successful. Very successful. And speaking of Adelina Patty, Speaking of Adelina Patty, it was actually Adelina Patty's manager who recommended she join a tour with the Fist Jubilee Singers, where she toured the Caribbean around 1892. Around this time, it was a critic at a theater who worked for a theater journal called the New York Clipper, who dubbed her the Black Patty. Now. She actually didn't like being preferred, being called the Black Patty. She preferred to be called Madam Jones. She said she was afraid people will think I will consider myself equal to the singer Adelina Patty herself. She said, I, I assure you, I don't think so, but I have a voice and I'm striving to win the favor of the public by honest merit and hard work. And eventually she did. Again, she sung for four presidents and the British royal family, which, you know, again, we're going to talk about this. All right. So, again, this was in the 1800s now. And for her to make the kind of money she made was a big deal. Was a big deal. And I don't want to jump over the reality of that time 
While she did sing for four presidents and the British royal family, we know what was going on in the country. She had to go through the back door. Now, when she sang for the president, Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt, well, she was allowed to enter the front door, but that's not her fault. It's not her fault the position she was in because, do I have to even say it? And I'm not blaming white people for that fully. You know, the position she had in society because of the way things were set up and having to use her voice, her singing voice, and, and work for herself. And because she had no one to truly depend on like that. And I don't want to make this into a negative video, but, you know, black men played a role in her reality of having to go through back doors because of her position in society, which is linked to the men. But we can talk about that for a whole different video. So she did get to go through the front door when she sang for President Theodore Roosevelt. All right. So, give me a second. In June of 1892, she became the first African African American woman to sing at Carnegie Hall, which was a very big deal. She became more popular performing at different venues and her options expanded when it came to making money. She was at first making $150 a week plus expenses. But a guy named Major Jones B. Pond, I believe, well, he helped, you know, further her career. He was managing Mark Twain. And these are legendary, famous, these are legendary, excuse me, famous people in this country. You got Mark Twain, Henry, what was this guy's name? Henry Ward Beecher. And she started making more money. She eventually was making $2,000, which was the highest amount for any black artist during that time. $2,000 back in the day was a very big deal. $2,000. She traveled. And in her notes, what's interesting is she said that she encountered less racism or prejudice towards her in Europe than she did in the United States. Let's not forget black people, especially black men, was going over to France where they felt more free. And um, all right, now what I want to do, I want to share with you this clip. Who she was and what happened to her that really, really brought a tear to my eye. Sit back for a good, a good two minutes and watch this clip about the Black Patty. I want you to give me one quick little second. Let's, let's take in this history, this, this woman forgotten by history. Let's really, I mean, it's amazing. I'm amazed by her. So here it is. Hello, my name is Gino Francesconi. I'm the director of the archives in the Rose Museum at Carnegie Hall. Here's a singer, a vocalist, that's been forgotten and shouldn't be. Her name was Sissioretta Jones, and she was known in her day as the Black Patti. That's how she was identified. And Adelina Patti, as you can see here in this program, was a, one of the great singers of her day, and she was simply known as Patti. And so, Sissiretta Jones was known as the Black Patti. And now imagine, here was a woman who at her peak of performing, had sung at the White House, was making $2,000 a week. She divorced her husband and won. She sued her white manager and won. And she was singing around the world and she was given brooches and medals made out of, of diamonds and rubies or gold. 
and she would wear them at every recital like a brigadier general. She would walk out in these astonishing gowns and having all of her uh, awards attached to her gown. And then her mother became ill in Providence, Rhode Island. She gave up everything to be with her mother. She had four homes around the country. And when she stopped singing, the money stopped coming in. And one by one, she had to sell her homes. And then one by one, she had to sell these phenomenal medals and brooches. And yet, uh, it wasn't enough. And by 1930, uh, she died in poverty and forgotten. And she's buried in Providence, Rhode Island. We were thrilled when we discovered that Howard University had one of only three medals that she kept for herself as souvenirs. And one of those medals is one that was given to her at Carnegie Hall. It's an extraordinary piece, and we're grateful to Howard University that they've given it to us on an extended loan where it's on view in the museum on a regular basis. Wow. Wow. Okay. So that was a small clip about her. There's just one other video here on YouTube about the Black Patty's life. Okay. And that's the original video that I saw. I might have saw the other one, but, you know, she wore all her medals because she was proud of her accomplishments. As you can see in this photo, she showed off all her medals and she tragically died in poverty and forgotten. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. You know, again, this might to someone not seem like a big thing, but you have to understand this was the early 1800s. There weren't any well-known Black women opera singers, especially bringing in $2,000, I think, a week. A lot of money traveling the world and not having to suffer completely, you know, being able to use her voice to get herself out of poverty. That's what That was her gift and what helped get her, besides God helping her, of course, but, you know, get her to to be successful and for her to die the way she did. And what made it so sad to me was that she didn't even have a gravestone until 2018, 2018, just, you know, no one, people walk over the grass at the graveyard and don't know the black patty is that's the black patty, you know, thankfully now she has her gravestone. Now, I, I'm a collector, as many of you know, and I said, oh my God, I have to find something to collect when it comes to her. I have to find something, and it was very, very hard. No album, no magazine covers, I mean, anything that was around then, you know, I, it's, it's hard. Maybe someone has it, but it's not on eBay or Amazon. So what I was able to find Okay, let me show you what I was able to find. All right. On eBay, there's a book that was published in 2012 called Sister Retta Jones, The Greatest Singer of Her Race, 1868 through 1933. It only costs, you know, $4.69. There are a few more on there. And that book was published about her. And someone is claiming to have an autograph of her. I don't know if this is the real autograph, but they want $1,155 for it. They said it's an extremely rare autograph of Ciceretta Jones, an African-American opera singer. So if that is the real signature, I believe it's worth it to have. I would love to have something more. So, okay. So that was on eBay. Also, 
again, you have the books, different prices, but the lowest price was $4.69 for the book. I think her film should be made into a film. I would love to see it about her. You know, she's one, another woman to respect and admire for what she was doing. I also admire Madam C.J. Walker. We all know, most of us know who she was. She's the first woman millionaire in this country. The first woman millionaire, and she's African-American. She's legendary for the hair care business. There are a few products on eBay, uh, collectibles, if you're a collector, uh, from Madam C.J. Walker. Uh, there was a film sort of made about her called Self Made. Um, some of it was uh, some fictional events added, but it was inspired by her, leg her legacy. And it's on Netflix. It was called Self Made, inspired by the life of Madam C.J. Walker. And, you know, so many of us know about who Madam C.J. Walker was. And it's amazing to know. And I would love for there to be. Let me make this smaller. I would truly love for there to be a film on the Black Patty. Give me a second. My, my laptop almost fell off. You know, leave the number one in the chat if you would love to see a film made about the life of the Black Patty, Ciceretta Jones. Because I definitely would love to. Okay, give me one quick little second. So, again, I want to talk about a few things about her life. I love this photo right here of her. Looking regal, feminine. A self-made woman. So I was researching a little bit. What could I find more about her life? And I did find out some things. In 1883, she was married to a man named David Richard Jones a news dealer and a hotel bellman. He was actually her first manager. She was around 14 when he was her first manager. She later filed for divorce in 1898 because he was a drunk and his lack of support. I can assume this was financial. Now she was divorced from him because of the misuse of her money or their money. But let's be honest here. She was more than likely the breadwinner. And he was gambling the money. And she said she had a lack of support and he was getting drunk. So this was basically, I'm sorry to say this, this was some dustiness with the man going on back then. Then in 1950, 15, 1915, her mom became ill. She gave up her career to help her mother, and then she devoted her life to the church. And despite what she went through, she took in homeless children. And she had two adopted children. I'm going to assume maybe the homeless children she took in, maybe she adopted two of them. Then what makes me, it, it was so sad to me, all her accomplishments, all her wealth. Okay, she has, let's be honest, her dusty husband misusing the fun, the money getting drunk, her mother falls ill, she gives up her, her lavish career. Any, wo any woman that loves her mother would, you're going to take care of your mom. But she did everything she has to do. And then it got so bad that she had to sell her medals, which she used to always proudly display on her clothing for her accomplishments. She had to end up selling them just to make money to help take care of her mother and herself, her all her jewelry, everything. And in her final years of her life, she died poor and couldn't even have a tombstone, 
a gravestone. And in the final years of her of her life, the president of her local NAACP, well, he did help pay her taxes, such as the water bill, paying for coal and wood to keep the house warm. In 1933, she died of poverty from cancer, and she couldn't she couldn't prepare and afford to pay for her gravestone. Now, again. Finally, she was able to have one. In 2018, money was finally raised. And I believe it might have been uh, people involved in Carnegie Hall. I'm not completely sure. It probably was people from all backgrounds and races, I'm sure, probably, that uh, raised the money to finally give her that kind of dignity and, and honor and respect in Rhode Island. There is a statue, I think, in the park or somewhere in Rhode Island in honor of her because she's a part of, you know, the history in that state and the history period. And um, even though she died not being remembered, she didn't have her wealth that she accumulated I just wanted to share her story today. Now we know her. Now many of you know who she is, who she was. American history. But I'm not going to ignore, of course, a part of black history. An African-American woman who rose to fame, becoming the highest paid black entertainer in the whole country during the 1800s. Singing for four presidents. That's like, this was the Beyonce. And I, I mean, I know Beyonce and her style of music. I'm just trying to make a comparison because Beyonce is like, has been the biggest singer for over a decade in this country. And, you know, a black woman. Well, during that time, this is who was. Even though, you know, we know jazz became very popular. Opera was very, a very respected um, style of singing. And people still love it. I don't know if I can say it was very popular with a number of Black people here to listen to opera. I like Sarah Brightman, who's an opera singer, but I don't meet many Black women that I know of that like opera. I'm sure they're out there. But, um, yeah, she became the biggest singer, not just opera singer, but the biggest entertainer, period, black person in this country, 2,000 a week, countless medals, singing for presidents, traveling the globe, singing for the British royal family, and then she doesn't even have a, a gravestone, has to sell off her medals, her husband uses up the money, her mother gets sick, and then she has, she cares for her as any loving daughter is, or would. She's a woman of God, devotes her life to the church. Despite her hardships, she still takes in homeless children because of the beautiful heart she had in so many black women. And then dies in poverty and has to sell the medals she won just to make it. This is a disgrace. It was a tragedy, but her life is beautiful, too, because of what she was able to do. But the sad thing is, all these years, and the average, you ask the average Black person in particular, ask them, have you heard of her? I guarantee you, we don't even know or didn't know who the hell she was. And that's what makes it more astounding and tragic. But the fact that we're talking about her today is what makes it beautiful. Because now many of you know who she is. Who she was. Don't forget. The Black Patty. I know she didn't uh, reportedly really care for that name. But that's just, that, that made her popular. You know, because Adelina Patty was extremely popular. And, you know, they made the comparison. But the Black Patty, 
a her real name, Matilda Ciceretta Joyner Jones. Remember her, not just on Black History Month, but now you can tell your daughters about her and your sons. And you don't have to be Black to do that, anybody, but you know what I'm saying. I'm sorry we forgot you. I'm sorry you didn't have a tombstone until 2018. And damn it, I'm going to take it there. I don't care if this sounds positive or negative. Where were we, damn it? We got plenty of black millionaires and, and a few, and I won't say a lot of billionaires, but we got plenty of millionaires, black millionaires in this country. Let this be a reminder. I mean, seriously. It shouldn't have taken until 2018 for this accomplished legend to get a gravestone in 2018. That could have been done. Even back in her day. Why didn't we come for her? To remember her and give her at least a damn gravestone. What? Where was her story at in the paper? The local president, NAACP leader, he knew who she was. He was helping paying her her water bill. Couldn't there have been a call or something to come together to at least give her a gravestone? I'm happy she eventually got it. But damn, it, it makes me upset stuff like that. Because you can't bring in white people or try to say, well, they took away her history. They whitewashed. No, all of that. Where were you? Or maybe she just didn't mean anything to him. You don't have to celebrate every damn... Bl <laughs> Let's just get into it. I'm going to say this. I'm going to save this for a future video. I'm going to say this for a black people, period, in this country and worldwide, but especially in America. You don't have to wait on other people to give you permission to change things or to do something. You don't need the approval or the okay. You have the money. You can do something. People talk about culture. Culture can change any day of the week. Cult, if you don't want something prevalent in your so-called community, you change it and then you get a new culture. You don't need anybody's permission or have to wait around for that. It's a choice. If the collective gives a damn. But I'll save that for a whole different video. We got a lot more forgotten about. And I'm going to bring to light a story I found out about of another black woman. She was a young black girl. You won't believe this one. Never heard of it my whole life until recently. Couldn't believe it. The awakening will continue. And we will talk about things hidden. Women. I, you know I'm pro-black woman. I'm pro-black. I'm, I'm pro-human. And especially I'm pro-black woman. Y'all know what I mean. <laughs> Damn it. I'm remembering her. And I want you all to know who she is, who she was. And now you can also research yourself about the Black Patty, find out even more about her. And you can look at this with pride. And let her be an example for us as well. If we have goals and dreams, things that can be accomplished. That you can live your dream. That God can help you live your dream. That things are possible. So, rest in peace, Ciceretta Jones, a.k.a. known back then as the Black Patty. The greatest singer of her race, as she was called in the book. You are remembered. And... Thank you all who came in here and joined to find out who this legend is and was by the Black Patty 
And bye, everybody. Thank you for joining. Peace.